Welcome to the Create a Push, an intimate and diverse artist interview series. Here, artists and makers of all kinds share tips, advice, knowledge, and inspiration that you can learn from. This series is a part of the Learn and Create platform to help artists further their education in creativity, art, and business. I'm your host, Sherry O'Neill, a photographer, artist, writer, and educator. Today, we have Troy Kemp. He is an artist a singer, a songwriter from Newcastle, Australia. Thank you so much for having me on today. Absolute pleasure. I'm, I'm really uh, excited to be here. So thank you. Tell me about your path to where you are today. It's funny. I was born in a small town called Kempsey. Um, so I'm Troy Kemp from Kempsey. And, and strangely enough, I actually lived in Kemp Street. So I never got lost. I was Troy Kemp from Kemp Street, Kempsey. You know, and it's a small country town on the east coast of Australia. My dad was a, a physiotherapist. My mum was a nurse. So I was, you know, a health family. My dad was a guitar player and a surfer, and uh, so he had me doing both of those things from a very young age. I was surfing by the time I was 10. I was playing guitar by the time I was sort of 12, and my dad would sit me down every night. And my mum was a beautiful piano player. You know, my dad used to get his buddies around and jam. So from a young age, I was always just around music, and I loved it. And, you know, I grew up in a house full of ABBA records and Bee Gees records. And, and, you know, then I remember my dad getting Back in Black by ACDC, and I just heard... I heard these big rock guitars for the first time in my life. And I'm like, oh my God, that's amazing. It's actually my grandmother's fault, I think, that I really turned to music. At the age of six, she bought me a cassette by Kiss called Dynasty. And I think the very first song on that cassette was called I Was Made For Loving You, which we all know. And I heard that. I heard this digga, 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 and this cool guitar thing. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's what I want to do for my whole life. I just want to be a musician. So as soon as I was in high school, I was trying to put bands together with, with you know, other guys in my grade at school. And we started a little band called White Light because we thought that was really cool, you know, and we were trying to learn all these Australian cover songs by bands but like In Excess and, and, uh, and Midnight Oil and The Angels and all these Australian bands. And we are playing sort of top 40 pop rock songs. And I did that all through high school with this band, White Light. And eventually we changed our name and we became Fox. Nothing to do with country music. I, at the time, I didn't like country music. I thought it was just not cool. Australian country music is a lot more sort of traditional, has its own sound. John Williamson, Slim Dusty, all these people, you know, they sing with a real Australian accent, you know, out on the grass underneath the chandelier of stars. And I'm like, oh, my God. So that wasn't <laughs> cool to me, you know. So by my mid-teens, I started to hear bands on, on music shows on television. Bon Jovi hit with, you know, uh, You Give Love a Bad Name. And then the next day I saw Europe, the final countdown, and I'm like, what is this cool commercial rock stuff that's happened? It was a little different to what I was doing with my bands, Fox and White Light. So the next thing I'm growing my hair out, I had hair like Sebastian Bach out of skin. I had hair like yours. And I started playing in metal bands. I ended up moving to Sydney when I finished school. I had a band called Court Jester and we were playing all around Sydney in all the heavy metal venues, playing headbanging music with long hair. We had leather jackets and tassels and cowboy boots with our jeans tucked into them, you know, because that was cool back then. You know, and country music was never a thing for me. It's like, it's like I did, wasn't even thinking in that sort of vein. But my grandparents, they were... They were big Slim Dusty fans, back to the country guy, and they're like, oh, Troy, you need to go and play Slim Dusty songs. I'm like, no, I don't want to play Slim Dusty songs. I don't even know what I did. Like, what's this? I didn't even know what a Slim Dusty was, you know what I mean? Um, sounds like some sort of burger. I moved to Canada early 2000s on a, on a, on a one-year holiday working visa and while, while I was living in Canada for a couple of years uh, in, in Toronto and, and strange enough, in, in a state, in a province called Saskatchewan. I moved to a town called Regina. I started to do music with different people in Canada. I teamed up with a guy named Kent Rock. So we had this little duo called Kent Rock. We were playing around Toronto just as an acoustic duo, playing, playing songs that kind of sounded somewhere between Lifehouse meets Nickelback meets, you know, some sort of 80s sort of sound. And then a girl came into my life called Sarah and I met her and she was into musical theatre and we became a couple and I started hanging out with her too much and Kent got upset about it. We split up. Sarah and I started doing music together. I started writing these songs that were more folky and more sort of country sounding, you know, for the first time in my life, early to late sort of, you know, between 2000 and sort of 2005. We didn't last. I moved back to Australia, but suddenly I'm writing these songs that sound more country. What people were saying to me, Troy, when you're not screaming and trying to sound like a heavy metal rock star, you know, you actually sound good singing country music. And I'm like, oh my God, am I hearing this? Like, I thought that was the weirdest thing. So I kind of turned my attentions to country just as a thing. I came across to Nashville in 2007. I recorded with a guy named Mark Moffat, who's an Australian producer that lives here. And I, and I recorded six or seven songs with him. It's just as an EP. I, I took it back to Australia. I ended up with the, with the first single I released on it, ended up on country music television over there. And next thing I'm getting calls from a guy who was putting together this Australian theme show called Aussies Walk the Line. And it was kind of like a, a tribute to Johnny Cash and the Highwaymen show. So I, I became the part of Waylon Jennings in this 
Four Piece Australian sort of concept show. We started a tour around, you know, I guess around 2010. And one of the other guys in the group was, was his name was Drew McAllister, and he was playing the part of Johnny Cash. On tour, we started to write songs together just in our, you know, in our spare time in, in motel rooms. And, and one of the other guys in the group came in and said, you guys sound really good together. Why don't you put together like a, a country duo like Brooks and Dunn? And we're like, no, nah, that's a stupid idea, man. Like, we don't want to do that. He kept ringing me and he kept ringing Drew. And eventually we caved in. We said, let's give this thing a go. We did a show with a, with a guy named Adam Brand, who's a pretty big name country artist in Australia. Our first show was with him as his opening act. He watched us play that night. He really liked our show. So we ended up seeing saying, look, I want to manage you guys. I want to take you out on the road and sort of just get you to play to my crowd for like 12 months. So the next thing we're on the road on a tour bus with this guy, like it all starts to blow up. We're playing the big crowds. Uh, with him, he helped us get a record deal through a, a label called ABC Records. And six years later, we'd won Golden Guitar Awards and CMC Awards. We'd had 11 number ones. And we were coming back and forth to Nashville a lot as well, just to write songs, record songs. We did our, our third album was done over here with some really great musicians in Berry Hill at a place called The Ruckus Room. I, did, I just developed a love of Nashville and, and, and the vibe of the whole place. And and I just knew that in my head, I just wanted to personally get here one day. And we got to a point in around 2015 where I just said to Drew McAllister, I said, buddy, I want to, you know, I want to take this thing to Nashville and, and let's let's see if we can get it over there. And we'd, we'd been doing things. We'd opened for Alan Jackson in Australia. We'd done all the arenas with Alan Jackson. We'd played with Big and Rich. He didn't want to come to America. He didn't want to pack up and move his family here. So I just said, well, dude. I'm so sorry, but I want, I'm going to do this, you know. So we we we, did, we parted ways. Then I get offered a record deal by a, a, another Australian company on my own who promised me the world. So I said, okay, I'll do that. So suddenly, I, I, you know, I signed this record deal on my own, put out my own album. Had, you know, I had two number ones off that album myself, which is a cool thing to happen after being in the duo because I was really nervous about are people going to like me on my own? But I kind of essentially locked myself to Australia for like another two years, you know, because I wasn't allowed to leave. I had to tour and promote the album there. So about three years ago, I that finished that, that tour and that album, the life of that album. So I, I started a green card application and with my wife was like, okay, let's do this. She wanted, she said, I'm happy to move to America with you. I want to support you with this. So we started a, a green card application that should have taken nine months. But there was government shutdowns over here and different things over the last few years. It ended up dragging the whole the whole process. Ended up taking two and a half years. It cost me twenty thousand dollars. We're selling our house. We're selling our cars. We're trying to pack our whole life up, and, and we're just giving people things. We're taking taking other parts of furniture and, and and you know knives and forks and everything we own to Goodwill, you know, type stores around the place just to you know get rid of our life, and then. We finally get our final approval to move to America on March the 3rd, 2020. Like, that's the day the tornado hits Nashville. We're just sitting, we're sitting there on the news going, oh, my God, we've just been approved to move to this place. Finally, a tornado just hit. Our parents are like, we don't want you guys to move there. Like, this is crazy. And we're like, no, this has been two and a half years. But, you know, a lot of money, a lot of pain and heartache. We're doing this. So we, we booked our flights for the 24th of March. And a week before that, coronavirus hits. All the flights get cancelled. And we're just like, oh, my God. So it's like, we're never getting to America. It's just like, this is horrible. We were given three months to be out of the country. Otherwise, our, our case would be null and void. Our immigration lawyer starts ringing us from Franklin. Guys, you need to get out because if you don't get out in the next the two weeks, you might get stuck and lose your whole application. And we're like, oh my God. So next thing we're trying to apply to the government, the Department of Home Affairs to leave during a, a pandemic. They knocked us back on our first application. So we had to create a massive paper trail of where we we're going to live and they wanted proof of sale of cars, sale of house, letters from the place we we're going to live in Nashville, where we were going to work in Nashville. It became a massive process just to get out of the country. But they finally let us leave and we left on the 7th of May when we flew 31 hours across the world in a face mask three flights from Sydney to San Fran, San Fran to Houston, Houston to Nashville, pretty much on empty planes, empty airports. And it was just the strangest experience of my life, you know, and then to arrive in Nashville at 11 o'clock at night in a pitch black airport with no one there, just us two walking through the corridors, hoping that our bags were going to be at the baggage claim. Thankfully, they were. Eight months later, we're still trying to find our feet in Nashville, you know, because it was, it was in the middle of COVID, so we couldn't get any work. We're living in down in town here in the, in the middle of town in, in Music Row and paying big rent with no work. And I'm just trying to survive off doing like Facebook live streams. My wife's a hairdresser and she can't get into a salon because none of them are open. So everybody that I met in the building we live in, I'm like, do you need a haircut? Do you need a haircut? Do you need a haircut? Just to try and <laughs> just to try and help pay the rent. We scraped by and just hung tight and held on and, and just we had a few really tough days and some sad days and we survived. I'm now getting gigs. Alicia's now in a salon. 
and we made it. We're going to survive here and, and things are starting to feel good. And it's I'm really proud of us because we hung on and, and I'm really excited to be in Nashville and, and finally be getting to do what I want to do, you know. So. How does one move from another country like that with all your belongings? Did you, I mean, do you have that stuff shipped over later? So we sold everything. We literally got our life down to five suitcases full of clothes. That was it. Like, I, you know, I, I did leave a, a, a couple of guitars, a sound system and, and a few things in a friend's garage back at home you know, my dad got a few boxes my mom got a few boxes of my stuff but what did your friends think of you switching from rock to country well all the boys that I was playing rock with just thought it was a really bizarre move they're like what are you doing man like we thought you were cooler than that I just said look guys I'm kind of done like I'm you know I was always the singer in these rock bands my throat was sore because I was always screaming I was kind of singing somewhere between you know, almost like James Hetfield out of Metallica, you know, it was always really hard and high notes and and raspy and to sound cool. And it takes, it really takes its toll on your voice, you know, so country music can be a lot more forgiving and and, and a lot more gentle on your throat. I felt good, you know, as I'm getting older, it just feels like the right progression for me to do that. You know? I feel really at home in country music now. It's been like the last sort of 15 years of my life. I've sort of gone now from being a pretty big fish in a small pond that Australia is for country music to getting over here and being a tiny fish in a huge pond and, and now trying to work my way up. And it's hard, you know, there's so much talent in this country and there's lots of younger artists coming through that are amazing. So I feel like, you know, age you know, age might be stacked against me a little bit. But at the end of the day, I think it's all about a great song anyway. So I think you just need to have that one song that really connects with people. Did you write rock music or did you start writing when you turned over to country? So I wrote all the rock stuff that I did and, you know, I was right into writing all those really heavy guitar riffs and my life was like literally I was just a total headbanger and, you know, it was just, I guess you guys called them hair bands over here, mm-hmm. right? All those bands back in the days and just love songwriting. Like I just, I, I look forward to waking up every week and trying to write five songs every week, you know what I mean? And, and I'm doing that in this town. I'm going to give it my best shot and it's, you know, at least I can sort of, can say, at least I can say I didn't die wondering, you know? Now that you're in Nashville, are you looking to get a publishing deal or an artist deal or are you wanting to kind of go this route on your own independently? You know, I'd love to get a publishing deal here and, and an artist deal here. I mean, that's 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 the big goal for me. You know, I think it's knowing how important it is to have a good team behind you. And, and it's like it's like a machine when you've got a label behind you and a good manager and a, and a good agent. They're the ones that do it all. You know what I mean? You're just the paint on the canvas. But it's nice to have that, to, that team behind you that says, this is what you're doing this week. This is the tool. This is what it all looks like. When you're doing that on your own, it's really hard. It's really hard to be the guy that's writing the songs, recording the songs, getting out and trying to perform the songs and trying to book the flights and trying to book a tour and trying to do your social media. It's just so much, you know what I mean? And so that's kind of what I'm shooting for. And I do have a publishing deal through a company called Cobalt Music Publishing, but it's a very loose sort of arrangement. It's enough to sort of get me in, in songwriting rooms here, be it they're not open right now because of COVID still. So I'm hope, I can't wait for them to open just so I can hopefully get in and meet some great songwriters here. But but if none of it happens, I'm just going to put together a band and just try and, you know, just keep chipping away on my own anyway. So it's, how are you surviving now? Are you doing online concerts? Well, you know, last year in particular, I was doing like every other weekend, every other week, every other Saturday, I was online doing a Facebook live stream and I'd get on for an hour and a half. I'd put up my Venmo and my PayPal details. And thankfully, a lot of people back in Australia really supported me through that time and pretty much helped us pay our rent, you know, and they, they kept us alive and, and I'll be forever grateful for that. Are your fans <laughs> keeping up with you from Australia? They do, and they're they're so supportive, you know. And any, and I, I try to you know post on social media as much as I can. These are my gigs for the week or whatever. So if they see me playing at Jason Aldean's or Florida Georgia Lions Bar, or, they think it's pretty cool. Go you, like you know, good on you, man. You're living your dream and taking it all in and enjoying it. And even friends from school who I grew up with, even the guys in the rock bands are now writing to me and saying, "Good on you, man. We're really really proud of you," you know, because they're all married with kids. And did you go to school for music of, of any kind? But no, I didn't have any sort of school or formal training. In Nashville, you've got Belmont University and people go there to do music and all those all the amazing schools that people can go to for music in this country. It's just America's really lucky to have that. The success I had with McAllister Camp was probably the best thing that ever happened to me for music. It's like five or six great years of touring and doing some really big shows and winning awards and all the chart results. And it was a culmination of all that stuff that essentially helped me get my my green card. I wouldn't have gotten my green card without all of that. Tell me about your process of writing. Do you record as you're writing? I don't typically don't start with, with lyrics. I always just sort of start playing some chords and I start to hum a tune to the chords. 
Then some words start to fall out. If anything, any of it sounds cool, I start to write it down. I open notes on my computer on my Mac here and I start to write some words down. And generally a chorus will come to me before even a verse. You know, I woke up with a with a full chorus. I've got a song in my head, I've got to go. So I just ran straight to my studio and wrote the words straight down and then grabbed my guitar. And I knew I already could hear what the music was doing in my head. I knew what I wanted it to sound like. So I just started jamming. But it's always the music first. Then I start get some chords and I try to formulate it verse chorus second verse chorus then you might go to a solo or a bridge and then you sort of bring it back to like a breakdown chorus and then you'll finish with a big chorus and the song fades out it's just a bit of a template that i always sort of stick to but then I'll, I'll do a little quick demo of it on my acoustic guitar i might, I might just sing it into my phone on, on the voice memo thing which is my voice and guitar but i've got logic at home so a little home studio here so i can make some drums up do a quick bass line just even on my little computer here i've got like a little midi keyboard so i can do them Dum, 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 dum. play some bass lines, play some acoustic guitar in, throw some electric guitar in, jump on this microphone and quickly sing a vocal. And, you know, in a couple of hours, I can have a pretty good little demo of my new song. I can then take that to Ben at the studio and say, hey, this is what I've done. How have you networked? What has been your process, especially during a pandemic? I was lucky because a few years ago, I recorded a song called Beach Mode and I was recording with a guy in Australia named Andrew Cochran. And he, uh, he said to me, you know, what songs have you got? And I had a few songs that I played him and he, and he said to me, would you would you be open to recording a song from Nashville? He showed me this song called Beach Mode and I, I just was like, oh, that's actually, I love that. That's really cool. I want to record that. So I, I did my own recording of the song Beach Mode. The guy who sent the song to Andrew was a guy named Shane Barrett and he's essentially a music publisher, song plugger in, in Nashville and he's, and he's had some big hits. I guess when I recorded Beach Mode, he got in touch with me and he said, dude, thank you so much for recording that song it's one of my songs from from my publishing company and th- these are the two guys that wrote it they're really excited that you've recorded it you know you know they said they, they wanted me to say thank you to you and stuff so I stayed in touch with Shane letting him know that eventually I was going to move to Nashville and be, when I got here you know we, we maintained that friendship I, I got on zoom with him one day when I first arrived and I said mate you know I'm here and I, it'd be really cool if you could help me sort of meet some good songwriters in town because you've, you've got that stable of guys. So he started sending me a whole bunch of demos of different songwriters, you know. So he literally sent me like 30 guys, you know what I mean? So I was like, wow. So suddenly I'm like, I like the sound of this guy and this guy and this guy. So the next thing he's hooking us up on introductory emails. We've all become guys that I write weekly with now on Zoom. So, that, so I've met all those guys and I've developed a really cool little network of songwriters through Shane Barrett. I've also living in a building with 270 apartments and half the building's full of musicians. I'm hanging around the pool, I'm hanging in the gym, I'm meeting musicians every day. And it's just like, oh, do you want to write a song? Do you want to write a song? Do you want to write a song? So that's starting to happen. I'm literally walking out the door with my guitar and walking down the corridor and into someone else's apartment for three or four hours and we're writing a song. So that's really cool. And I think that's just got to happen everywhere in Nashville. And then, like I said, I've gotten into these songwriter nights over on, on Music Row now. So I'm on stage essentially with three other songwriters every night that I've never met. But you get up there, you have a good time and you and you meet them, you're hanging out, you, you do your three or four songs each and then you get off. But then you you hang out with them, you have a drink with them, you shake their hand, you, you swap numbers. Let's write a song because everyone in, everyone in Nashville is saying, let's write a song. And I swear to God, there must be like 10,000 songs written in Nashville every day. Sometimes you write a song that's so good and you're like, oh, my God, do I record this myself or do I just try to get it to someone else? That's a tricky, tricky place to be in as well. What does creativity mean to you? But my whole life I've been creative and, 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 I, and I just feel like I get hit by songs, like they're just floating around in the, in the universe and like little bolts of lightning, they just hit you. And it's like, what's that? What's going on right now? Like what, what you know, and they're the songs that I think are the best songs because they're just like a gift from somewhere. You know what I mean? Gift from somewhere. It's like, where did that come from? I think being creative, you need to be really a, a, alert to things going on around you. Be, really, be creative in the things that you hear and listen to. Like I'm always hearing lines in movies or so many conversations every day. Someone says something in my head. I'm going, oh, my God, that's such a good line for a song. Oh, my God, that's a song title. To the point where my wife is like, now my wife's doing it because she's so, she hears me do it all the time, you know. <laughs> but being creative, I think, is just getting up every day and doing something for your career that might further it. You know, pick up your guitar, start writing some words, start writing some chords, the more you do it and the more you practice it, the better you get at it. What inspires you to create? I think life inspires me, the things I see, the things that I hear, the things that I watch. Never given up and just chase your dreams. That, that's inspiring to me. Or watching someone else's story and going, oh, my God, I want to write about that. I saw a meme recently. It was just a picture of two hands, uh, an old, like a, a father's hand. They're all dirty and they've got cuts on them. And she sort of said something. Little boy says, Daddy, does it hurt? Daddy says, if you like where you live and you're happy with everything you have, 
These Hands Don't Hurt. And I'm like, oh, my God, isn't that beautiful? You know what I mean? So I wrote a song called These Hands Don't Hurt. Try to write songs that connect with people. I want to write a song that, you know, you can listen to personally and go, oh, my God, like that could be my life or that's Mm -hmm. something I really get. What do you do when you get stuck? Pretty rarely that I get stuck because I just keep pushing myself. If I do get stuck, I usually get angry. And then I'll just put the guitar down and just walk away and just go and do something else. You know what I mean? And, I, and some days I just have to walk out and say to my wife, Alicia, you know what, Alicia, I need, a, I need a few days off. We just need to go and do something else. I'm very stubborn when it comes to songs. Like if I can be in a songwriting session with guys. We've done four hours and it's three quarters written and they're ready to tap out and go home. And I'm like, no, we're staying here and we're finishing this. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it's... It's so close, and I want and I want to hear what it's like. I want to hear I want to hear the final product. Is there um, anything that you want to learn that you haven't learned yet? I think you never stop learning in, in in music, and I and I think you'd be a fool to say I'm the best at anything. You know what I mean? I've got a long way to go as a songwriter. I've got a long way to go as a singer, as a as a guitar player. I just want to keep learning everything. You know, and I want to sit down and study great country music guitar courses just to learn how to play some really amazing country league guitar. You know, like I've always played rock league guitar and. And I and I do I know enough country league guitar to fake my way through it, you know what I mean? But there's a, there's a real art to that, and there's some incredible players in this town, you know. So to keep, I want to learn more about the business. I want I need to get better at social media. I need this. You can always improve yourself. If you had a chance to play on stage with one person, dead or alive, <laughs> yeah, who would you want to perform with? Madison Square Garden, Garth Brooks. Yeah. And and do you have a specific song you'd want to perform? Like if I could if I could do Friends in Low Places with Garth Brooks at Madison Square Garden or some huge stage, that'd be a that's definitely a dream, you know, for me. That'd be amazing. So, funnily enough, Alicia actually cut a lady's hair recently named Rebecca Magnuson, and um, a lovely lady. I've recently written a song with her. She had a pretty good career back in the nineties here, and she was a model in New York, and she's a beautiful lady. Her best friend in town is a governor is Bob Doyle, and Bob Doyle is Garth's manager. Mm-hmm. So so she's now telling Bob about me and sending him my songs. And I'm just sitting back going, what's what's going on here? Is this this is weird, you know what I mean? So I'm I'm all like fingers crossed every day that you know I get the phone call from from Rebecca Magnus and saying, hey, Bob wants to meet you or I don't know, or, or you know, or Garth wants to cut one of your songs, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. do you have any advice to give to any other songwriters or artists out there that are just starting out? First and foremost, just have fun. You know, I think that's the biggest thing for me. It's always just, if it's not fun, don't do it. Just work hard. You know, remember that song is king when you're writing songs. That's the thing that's going to make or break you just, you know, and it can be just one song if it's great. Aim to write songs that people can connect with. You know, that's that's the that's the, that's the one thing that Adam Brand told Drew McAllister and myself very early days when we started to tour with him back. He was the guy that gave us our start. He said to us, and he was, he was great at it, he just said, you guys have got all these fluffy little songs about boys and girls, you know, having a good time on back roads or whatever, but where's the songs about real stuff, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So when we started to write those songs, we suddenly started to get some a fan base, you know what I mean? It was like people started to follow McAllister Camp and the rest is history and it blew up. So I think it's that. I think that's important. I think you got to be amazing with your social media. Troy, listen to your own words right now. I need to get better at that. Um, write songs. Try to write every day. Write with other people. Don't be too stubborn to write with other people because for years I just thought I was I, I was the best and I was, the, I was the bomb and I didn't need any help, you know what I mean? But the minute you start to collaborate with other people, great ideas come in, you know what I mean? And you hear other things and... And if you can get a good little team around you, you don't have to have the best manager in the business. Just find a manager that wants to prove himself in the business. I've learned to enjoy the journey. I'm still loving the journey. I'm still learning. I've still got the fire in my belly more than I've ever had about trying to make something stick in this town. You know, like I'm so excited and I'm just so excited to be here and just keep my fingers crossed that it all goes well. Where can they find you? All of that good stuff. New music. I've, I've got obviously Spotify and 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 Apple Music and whatever whatever your streaming platform. I should be there just as Troy Kemp, K E M P. Um, and at Instagram and, and Facebook, I'm Troy Kemp Music. That's my handle for everything. Um, so I love it. People could go there and check it out. I did have a new song that came out just last week. It's called Taking Me Back. Hopefully, people can go and check that one out and and. and and play it like 9,000 times each. That'd be awesome just to get my script <laughs> But it's, yeah, I did any any support I can get from anyone is just always, you know, so, so appreciated. And uh, obviously I'm playing the Nashville downtown scene. I'm playing Puckets every Tuesday in Nashville, but 
I generally try to get all my gigs, obviously, online on my, on my social media so you can see where I'm at. If you're, if you're in the Nashville area and watching, you want to come down and hang and say hello, I'd love to meet you. Um, well, this has been wonderful, and I appreciate you taking the time to spend with me today, and I wish you all the best in Nashville. Thank you so much for listening. As always, my intention is to offer inspiration that excites you to want to get out there and create something amazing. Be sure to check out some of the other episodes, and I would love for you to share this with your friends if you think it would help them. There's more information below in the show notes, including links to other great stories, tips, and resources. Drop me a message or comment at any time, and I hope that you'll sign up to be a part of this creative tribe.